Hi everyone and welcome to this GCSE Astronomy support video in which we're going to look at one of the most important topics from the second half of the GCSE Astronomy specification. This part of the specification looks at telescopic astronomy which means Galileo's discoveries with one of the early telescopes is probably one of the most important topics within it. In this video we're hopefully going to get three things done. Firstly we're going to have a look in detail at a particular part of the GCSE Astronomy specification, section 11.24 which, as it says there, looks at the early observations that Galileo made with the, the telescope, or one of the first telescopes available. Um, but if you read it in detail, you'll see it's also linking it to the big debate between the geocentric, the Earth-centred, and the heliocentric, the Sun-centred view of the universe. Galileo's observations aren't just interesting observations. They also had a big impact on people changing their minds from geocentric to heliocentric. And that's why it's sp spelt out like that in the specification. Uh, secondly, Galileo, for some reason, seems to be one of those scientists about which there's a lot of misconceptions. Uh, many of the things you, you hear about, you even read about, perhaps, about Galileo aren't really true at all. And I don't know why he's attracted so many of these, but hopefully we're going to try and dispel a couple of them. If you're studying GCC astronomy, you ought to know the true story, I think, on a couple of things. Secondly, or well, thirdly rather, we're going to finish off with uh, some extension work. So if you really want to get deeply into this topic and you want to see how it links to other areas of the GCSE astronomy specification, then there'll be some ideas for things you could work on uh, at the end. Now, before we look in detail at Galileo's observations, it's always, as with any scientific discovery, to look at the context in which it was made. In other words, what were the big arguments in astronomy at the time Galileo was making his observations in the early 1600s? And, as the syllabus suggests, it was the big argument between the geocentric and the heliocentric. Okay? At the time, people, many people, certainly people in, in the street, and a lot of astronomers also believed the geocentric view of the universe. The Earth is at the centre. Uh, it's kind of common sense, really, I think. People kind of start from common sense, don't they? Um, if you look out at the world around you, it really doesn't seem to be moving. And if you want to look at the sun, the moon, the planets and the stars, they all seem to move around. If you watch them in the sky over a period of time, they do seem to be moving around the Earth. So the geocentric I like to think of as the common sense uh, view of the universe. But around the time of Galileo, there had been a number of suggestions. The actual suggestion is really quite an old one. Um, but some astronomers had really started to put some, some weight behind the idea of what we call the heliocentric or the sun-centred view. Okay? And at about that time, Galileo made his discoveries, and that's why they had such, uh, such a large impact. Now, the idea of the sun-centred universe was not due to Galileo. Again, I've seen that in, in some books. Uh, it was due to many people, but most popularly to a guy called Nicholas Copernicus. I think we've probably heard a lot about him um, because his book was written around about the time of the invention of the printing press. So his books didn't need to be copied out by hand, which took forever. Uh, they could be copied and uh, printed, and numbers of copies could be produced quite quickly. So we know quite a lot about Copernicus. There's a number of copies of his book, and if you look at his dates, um, nearly 100 years before Galileo, he had suggested... If you look at closely at the diagram on the right, I don't know what your medieval Latin is like, but the only word you need to read is the one in the middle, S-O-L, Sol, which obviously means the Sun. Copernicus suggested quite carefully that if you wanted to predict the motion of the, 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 the Sun, the Moon, and the planets in particular, then having the Sun at the centre made the mathematical calculations easier. Okay? Um, so he proposed a theory of the Sun at the centre of the universe, what we could now call a heliocentric theory. Okay, I think many people probably didn't hear much about it. Uh, Copernicus wrote his book for other scientists. He wrote it in Latin. Um, many people in Europe, I think, would have passed them by. And even if they had heard about it, if you imagine living in, in any time, um, in any part of the world at this time, people lived, lived very simple lives and no computers or television or anything like that. Um, the idea that anything other than everything goes around the Earth would have seemed a bit strange. Okay, So Copernicus has suggested his heliocentric theory, um, but it was Galileo with his telescope who actually started to provide some evidence. All right? Before Galileo, it was not just a philosophical argument, but it really was just something scientists argued about, really. Okay, Galileo's discoveries meant it was very much more uh, a matter of fact, I guess. There was some evidence in, in favour of one theory rather than the other. Okay. Um, so there's Galileo with the telescope. Uh, you can see there that's from the, the Great Museum in Florence where you can actually go and see Galileo's actual telescopes and some of his drawings there, which we'll look at in a bit more detail. And that brings us, I think, neatly on to uh, misconception number one. All right, Many people, many textbooks, I'm afraid to say, will tell you that Galileo invented the telescope, which he really didn't. Okay, Here's a quotation from the man himself. Uh, the key thing to notice there is he obviously, well, he says it exactly, he heard about the invention from a lens maker in Holland or the Netherlands. 
um, and he made some improvements upon it. That's exactly what happened. Okay, uh, so the invention of the telescope was not down to Galileo. If you're thinking, well, in that case, who did invent the telescope? Take your pick. Who was that mysterious lens maker in Holland? We're not entirely sure. Um, Hans Lippershe, Zacharias Janssen, and Jakob Metius. We all had a part, I think. You know, they all started to realise uh, they all had the techniques for making accurate lenses. And of course, once you can make one lens, you can make two. And then you put two lenses together and you have the very earliest telescopes. OK, so sometime in the 16, no, not very much in Holland, people possibly one of these three. We don't really know who quite exactly was first, uh, but this was the, the invention. OK, and the news slowly got around the world and not just Galileo. In fact, other people started to realise that you could make telescopes quite easily if you could get two lenses and a cardboard tube or a wooden tube. And they started to put them uh, together. Um, interestingly, you might think, why do we not know exactly who it was? Surely scientists would, would rave about this great discovery. Um, and it's to do with the fact that when telescopes were first invented, although when you say telescope, you think astronomy, at the time, there were much more profitable uses for telescopes. Warfare in the 1800s was lots of people on horses and stuff over big battlefields and so forth. Lots of that going on in Europe. If you think about it, if your army had a telescope and you could see what the other army a few miles away was doing in some detail and they couldn't see what you were doing, then you had a huge strategic advantage. The telescope was kind of the nuclear weapon of the, um, uh, the early 17th century. So the first lens makers who made telescopes, they would not be thinking about selling them or giving them to astronomers. They'd be thinking about uh, selling them to their local army who would be fighting the army next door or something and there was big big money to be made there okay so the first invention of the telescope um as i say it was largely a military or an espionage kind of thing and for that reason we don't know exactly who invented it but galileo by his own words clearly was not that person okay and in fact galileo the first time he invented the telescope although we have this idea he got the telescope and he looked at the night sky with it um as I say, when he heard about it, firstly, he was a good scientist and he realised that there was a way of improving it. But once he'd done that, did he think, yes, I'm going to look at the sky and forward astronomy? Actually, he didn't. He was living at the time in Venice, which was one of the great ports of the Mediterranean, great seagoing nation, lots of trading going on. And the ability to climb up one of those tall towers with your telescope and see ships coming uh, from miles away and to see whether they were heavily laden with stuff or whether they were riding higher in the water, which meant they hadn't got to any particular stuff to sell, uh, was a strategic advantage for people in uh, trade, people buying and selling stuff. And Galileo, when he first invented him, sorry, he got me saying it now, uh, Galileo, when he made his first improved telescope, realised that there was some money to be made here, and he got lots of uh, powerful merchants and people from the council in Venice. He took them famously up one of the towers and showed them how far out to sea you could, you could um, uh, see things. And as I say, at the time, he could definitely do with a stable job and some money. And so that was his first thought. And he did very well out of that. He got a position and uh, a regular income from uh, his new design of the telescope. So not inventing it, but changing it dramatically, making it much better. And after he'd sorted that out, he started to look at the night sky. Now, if you're going to look at the night sky, imagine you've just been given one of these brand new telescopes that no, hardly anybody in the world has. And I said to you, well, let's have a look at the night sky. Obviously, what are you going to look at? You're going to look at the moon, look at the stars, maybe the sun, a bit dangerous, as you probably know. Um, I'm sure Galileo did try it. We'll come to that a bit later on. But if you're looking in the night sky, what's there to see? There's the moon, obviously. Um, but there are also lots of dots, which at the time were called stars. And uh, some of them still are today. There were a few stars which little dots of light, which we know which change their position. You may know from other parts of the GCC astronomy course that many stars stay in a fixed pattern like um, Leo or Taurus or constellations like that. But there are some little dots of light which move around. And if you look night after night as this sort of mega time lapse picture shows, some dots of light in the sky are clearly funny sorts of stars because they move. They don't stay in a particular constellation, they move around, okay? In Galileo's time, there were five of these, Mars, sorry, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Now, I'm sure Galileo looked at the ordinary stars, like the stars in the plough or the pole star or something like that, and he would have been disappointed. Even with some of today's most powerful telescopes, stars still just look like dots of light because of their immense distance. Um, so Galileo would have perhaps quickly focused his attention on the more interesting stars, what we call the wandering stars, which from the Greek gives us the word planet. So Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn were potentially much more interesting uh, 
um, than most of the stars in the sky, which still look like dots, even with the, the newfangled telescope. And so the first observation we're going to have a look at, as I say, if we're following the specification, uh, one of the first things that Galileo looked at with his telescope in his early telescopic observations was the planet Jupiter. Okay, so a bright dot in the sky, it's still called a star, but it was called a wandering star because it doesn't stay in a fixed position. Galileo had a good look at it, very surprised to see that Jupiter was actually a little circle. As you can see, this is his actual drawing here, so you can see what he's, he's seen through the telescope. Uh, Jupiter, which to the naked eye is a dot, becomes a little circle, and around it there are four, if you look closely, Galileo still thinks they're stars, and you might think, gosh, how silly is that? That can't possibly be a star. A star is a very distant, it's another sun, isn't it? It can't possibly be going around a teaching planet like Jupiter. Uh, but remember, at the time, any dot in the sky was a star. So Galileo had no reason not to call them stars. When he wrote his observations up, he called them stars. Um, and so you've got these four little stars. We know they're moons, but uh, they're dots of light either way, uh, going around Jupiter. Okay. Galileo was a good scientist, repeated his observations night after night. He made himself a bit of a Jupiter diary. As you can see, the little boxes there, night after night, he watched these little dots going around. And he quickly realised, you can see, I don't know how good your Italian is, but... Uh, you can see from his diagrams with his arrows that he realised that uh, these little dots are moving like little ducks following their mother. Um, they're going around the planet Jupiter. There's a modern picture. Actually, not too hard to see. Actually, if you're if you're new to telescopic astronomy, if you've never used a telescope or binoculars before, then uh, the moons of Jupiter is quite a straightforward thing to see. You won't get quite as good an image as that one, perhaps. But even with a small telescope, you should be able to see the four little dots. Uh, either side of Jupiter. All right. Now, GCC Astronomy says you need to know about the observations of Galileo and how they link to the development of the heliocentric view. So this big argument at the time, is the Earth at the centre or is the Sun at the centre of the great clockwork solar system that we live in? Uh, how did these observations relate to that? Well, this one's pretty obvious. Um, the theory at the time was that everything went around the Earth. Galileo's just found four things that don't. Okay, he's got drawings, he's got evidence from a telescope of four things which clearly go round Jupiter. Okay, that doesn't prove it, but if the theory is everything goes round the Earth, this is a big piece of evidence for the first time in the other direction. Okay, people who'd put forward the heliocentric view before, people like Copernicus, their problem was they didn't really have any evidence. It's a big step to say to people, actually, we're a third rock from the sun, we're belting through space at many kilometres a second. That's very hard for people to get their head around, particularly in the 15th century. And Gal uh, Copernicus didn't have really any hard evidence. Galileo, for the first time using the telescope, uh, was able to start to put some evidence on the other side of the scales, if you see what I mean. So here's the first point then. Uh, four little moons going around Jupiter. Galileo called them stars, but that's just because they were dots of light. And they're important because, of course, they're orbiting Jupiter. They're not going around the Earth. Okay, something in the sky you can see that suggests the helios, the geocentric view, the earth centre view, may not be 100% right. His second observation, they're in no particular order, this isn't particularly the order he did them in. Um, as always in great scientific discoveries, there's some uh, lesser known scientists whose names seem to have got completely lost by history. So a small shout out here for Benedetto Castelli. Uh, Castelli read about Galileo's observations. Um, Galileo was quick to publish, as we'll see in a moment. And one of his former students, because Galileo used to teach maths, um, was a guy called Benedetto Castelli. And he had a think about this and he wrote to Galileo and said, well, if you think uh, things are going around the sun, then planets like Venus ought to show a slightly strange behaviour. We'll see how that works in a minute. But the idea of looking at Venus was not particularly Galileo's idea at first. It was suggested to him. Uh, by Castelli, and it turned out to be an excellent suggestion, as we'll see. Okay, Venus again, one of those five little dots of light in the sky that don't stay in the same pattern for millions and millions of years, but move around. Uh, I'm sure everybody uh, listening in must have seen Venus at some point. Um, quite often, people don't realise they're seeing Venus, but if you've ever looked into the sunset and you've seen a very bright star coming out in the sunset, uh, long before all the other stars, then that's definitely Venus. It's tremendously bright. It's bright. It's the brightest thing in the night sky after the moon. And uh, unfortunately, it always sinks down into the sky with the sunset. So around midnight, for example, you won't be able to see it. Or it rises in the dawn sky. Obviously, think about the organisation of the solar system. You're always looking towards the sun when you're looking at Venus. Uh, but Castelli suggested to Galileo that Venus might be a good thing to have a look at. And so Galileo did exactly that. He trained his telescope on Venus. 
and he watched it for a period of time and this is a collection of his drawings and very strange it doesn't look like a dot of light it looks like a disc like uh, Jupiter but Jupiter always appears as a circle Jupiter always appears as a full aspect Venus looks a bit different sometimes as you can see there it's a crescent sometimes it's a, a D shape or a, a quarter and sometimes it's slightly gibbous with the bulge to the left there um, and these are Galileo's drawings of Venus which he made okay now um, how is that different they're often referred to as the phases of Venus but that's actually not the most important thing top diagram there Galileo's drawings of the phases of Venus underneath the phase of the moon which you're very familiar with I'm sure having lived on the earth as hopefully most of us do um, and you can see the similarities crescent D shape gibbous and full but the big difference hopefully you've spotted it already is the change in size the moon shows phases but stays the same size if you look at that crescent moon on the left there from the top to the bottom it's the same size as the full moon okay so the circle of the moon even if some of it's covered up with shadow at all times the circle implied by the moon is the same size with Venus very different the crescent Venus is much bigger and the full Venus is much smaller okay so if you're learning this um, for the GCC astronomy although we refer to it as the phase of Venus that's kind of missing out the important thing is the changing size of Venus that's very important the phases of Venus are different to the phase of the moon they're the same shape but they don't keep a constant size Obviously, the moon keeps a constant size because it's going around the Earth in a roughly circular orbit. Venus, clearly something more complicated must be happening. Again, let's ask the question, because that's what the specification says. How do these observations relate to the argument between the Earth-centred, the geocentric, and the Sun-centred, the heliocentric view? And it's to do with this diagram. If you imagine we're on the Earth, so we're in the grandstand seat at the bottom of the diagram there, we're looking out. Uh, we're obviously moving around the Sun, but let's just forget that for a moment. Let's just move Venus around. So there's Venus in um, six different positions in its orbit. I think you can see for us to see Venus as a full, so a circle, it's got to be right over the other side. It's got to be in what's called superior conjunction. It's got to be right opposite us on the opposite side of the Sun. That's the only time we can see Venus as a full phase. Okay. For us to see Venus as a D shape, it needs to be sort of at the three o'clock, nine o'clock. Needs to be round at um, the three o'clock and nine o'clock positions in its own orbit. Now, to see Venus at the crescent phase, you obviously need it to be just either side of mu, exactly the same as the Moon, which means it needs to be just either side of the six o'clock position on its own orbit, um, marked in their inferior conjunction. So, just either side of inferior conjunction is when we're going to see Venus as a crescent. Now, although the diagram is drawn from a funny angle and it's not drawn to scale, I think you can see when Venus is at superior conjunction, in other words, when it's full, when it's either side of inferior conjunction, when it's at a crescent, there's a big difference between the distance between the Earth and Venus. Okay, Venus, as the full phase, is much further away from the Earth than when it's at the crescent phase. And therefore, this can only work if Venus is not going round the Earth. All right, Galileo's drawings of the phases of Venus because they show such differences in size, show that Venus must be orbiting the Sun. It certainly can't be orbiting the Earth like the Moon is, because if it orbited like the Earth like the Moon, it would show its phases, different shapes, but there would be no reason for it to change its size. Okay, And, as I said, that was a big piece of evidence in favour of the heliocentric theory. It kind of again suggests the geocentric theory can't be right. Okay, Venus, amongst all the other planets, Venus most certainly can't be going around the Earth, otherwise it wouldn't show such different sizes as it shows its phases. Okay. Now, uh, another important observation which Galileo made was to look at the Moon. Okay, You might have thought, well, actually, I would have done that first. But uh, the Moon observations of, observa of Galileo are a little bit harder to get your head around, so that's why I've left them till last. Okay. Uh, Galileo eventually got his telescope and looking at the Moon and he did some drawings. There's a photograph from his, uh, his notebook in itself. As you can see, he was a, a talented artist as well as a scientist. Some nice drawings there of the moon. Uh, you might think well, they don't look very good compared to a modern photograph. Uh, a bit of a challenge there. Get yourself a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. Go outside with a notepad and see if you can do better. It's uh, quite tricky to do when you're sort of squinting through one of the very first ever telescopes, which wouldn't be anything like as good as even quite a cheap modern one. Uh, Galileo, there's a close-up drawing there. He drew the moon in a lot of detail. He showed the craters, uh, the hills and the valleys and uh, mountains and stuff like that on the surface of the moon. Okay, 
And the question again, because we're following the specification, we know that Galileo observed the moon, fine, but how did it help to establish a heliocentric theory? At first sight, this seems a bit hard to get your head around, okay? But in fact, when Galileo published his observations, this was probably one of the biggest things, okay? The moons of Jupiter, the phases of Venus, give some quite clear evidence that the geocentric theory can't quite be right. The moon or the drawings of Galileo were very important, very influential at the time. OK, and again, let's see if we can get our heads around why that might be. There's a clue here in this quotation from the man himself. And as it says there, he has basically been led to the opinion that the surface of the moon is not smooth and uniform, as most people think is what he's saying there. OK, so very importantly, Galileo has discovered that the surface of the moon is not smooth and uniform. Now, this is difficult, obviously, as 21st century people. Um, we know that the moon is a big lump of rock going around the earth. People have been to it, people on the surface. We know a great deal about the moon. We know it's a um, big lump of rock going around the earth. Um, but at the time, that wasn't how people viewed the universe. So we need to just for a moment, if we're going to understand how the moon observations were so crucial in the geocentric, heliocentric argument, we need to just take a step back in time and just imagine we lived around the time of Galileo or a little before. Okay. Um, the universe was quite simple to explain. At the bottom there was the earth. The earth contains trees, flowers, animals, birds, penguins, people, all sorts of stuff like that. All things that live and, and grow and eventually die. All right? um, things like people and animals and plants, uh, which have a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, compared to that, there was the sky, in particular the night sky, which was seen as sort of holy and celestial and perfect that was the key thing the stars in the sky twinkle out beautifully and have done for millions and millions of years even though there are terrible wars on the earth and plagues and all sorts of things in there every night out come the stars and they look just as beautiful as they did at the time that we were just evolving and things like that okay so the idea was very strong in the 16th century way of looking at the universe that the stars were perfect OK, they didn't change. They were always absolutely perfect. Uh, the sun, again, looks fantastic. And the moon, again, is part of the night sky. The moving planets were a bit confusing. We really didn't quite understand what's going on there. But again, they every time you looked at them, they were nice and sparkly. They didn't rust. They didn't wear out. They didn't get old. There was very much this idea that the Earth was where living things, which live and die, were. Tem you know, things that were temporary are only on there for a certain amount of time. And then the sky the night sky in particular was was perfect and eternal and unchanging although things moved their positions they didn't grow old or wear out or anything like that okay and this was the view that Galileo had or the world had of the universe when Galileo made his observations in 1609 okay um, and for that reason I think you can see why Galileo's moon drawings are so important because for the first time they suggested the moon had earth-like features on it that it was a place like the earth um, i think for many people in galileo's time the night sky was flat it was just like a light show it had you know someone once described it as like a giant fruit bowl glass fruit bowl turned upside down on top of us um, there was no depth to it there was just stars and planets and distances to things it didn't really mean anything um, i think for many many people they thought of it like that and the moon was thought of as just a circle as like a disc which traveled across the sky okay Galileo is now suggesting with his drawings that the moon is actually a place with mountains and valleys and craters and all sorts of things, almost somewhere where you might be able one day to stand, to, to visit. And this was a massive idea. Previously, the universe had been the Earth with the light show going on in the night sky. The idea you could visit one of these pieces of light, that you could actually go to one of these places, was huge. And of course, remember what the argument is at the moment, does everything go around the Earth? Well, part of the argument is if, it, if everything doesn't go around the Earth, what could it go around? There's nowhere else in the universe. Galileo's drawings of the moon started to show that there might be other places. And therefore, if there are other places, things might be able to go around the moon. Or if some of the other dots are actual places, things might go around them. Okay. So although to 21st century eyes, so what? The moon's got valleys and mountains and craters. But actually in Galileo's time, this was a huge thing. And when he published his moon drawings, it just blew people's minds. Now, Galileo was not slow in coming forward, although other people around the world were putting together telescopes and starting to look at the night sky, as we'll see. Galileo did his observations starting in 1609. 
And again, because he lived in the age of the printing press, he got his book written, uh, he wrote it all up very speedily, and in 1610 he published his very important book called uh, The Starry Messenger, if you translate that title there. So he published The Starry Messenger, which contained his moon drawings, his uh, Jupiter diary, showing the little dots going around Jupiter, and the phases of Venus. Okay. And this was a, a huge seller. It was a massively successful book, possibly one of the best-selling books in Europe at the time. Um, made him a great deal of money, obviously, which was a good thing for him. But going back to the specification, this is a huge piece of evidence. All right, so this this slide kind of summarises what you need to know in some ways for the specification. Uh, Galileo did his early telescopic observations. He did the moonlight, Earth-like features on the moon, moons of Jupiter, and phases of Venus. And this was a huge piece of evidence in favour of the, sorry, in favour of the heliocentric view. Okay. Uh, again, it's not proof, but it, you know it shows very strongly that Venus must be going around the Sun uh, rather than the Earth. That the moons of Jupiter are clearly going around Jupiter and aren't the least bit interested in the Earth. And that the Moon might actually be a place, another place a bit like the Earth. So the idea that the whole universe had to go around a single Earth was heavily shaken by those moon drawings, even though to 21st century eyes they don't look anything particularly spectacular. Okay, um, So this is why Galileo's early telescopic observations, as it says in the spec, um, were hugely influential in developing the, from the geocentric view, the common sense view, to the heliocentric view. Okay. Now, uh, these observations were obviously a turning point. As I said, we're in the section on telescopic astronomy, and these are the beginning of telescopic astronomy and things about our universe that you can only find out with a telescope. There's so much you can do with the naked eye, as the first part of the specification shows you. But now, this is the, really the fundamental starting point for telescopic astronomy. For that reason, as I say, Gallo took these, started these observations in 1609. In 2009, um, which was obviously 400 years from Galileo's observations exactly, was celebrated right across the world pretty much. Almost every country in the world took part in the International Year of Astronomy. It was chosen for 2009 simply because it's 400 years precisely after these incredible observations of 1609. Okay. Now, um, as we are passing this way, uh, you do hear an awful lot of stuff talked about the fact that get these observations by Galileo were not welcomed by the church. And this is another of great Galileo misconceptions. And while we're passing, it's worth just mentioning for a second, and partly because it links to other areas. The link between astronomy and religion comes up in several points in the specification. And also, if you've studied GCSE astronomy, then you ought to know a bit about the true story. Um, I saw a documentary the other day by a national broadcasting corporation. You really ought to know better. And it shows their explanation was just the same one you find in textbooks all down the years, um, and isn't really not quite right at all. Okay, very famous painting there of the trial of Galileo. There is um, sort of in the middle there, and uh, a guard there to stop him running off, and some people from the church there looking a bit cross with him. And the the simplistic view, which I'm afraid you hear repeat all over the place, is that Galileo predict, um, wrote up his scientific observations. Um, and it disagreed with what's in the Bible, so the church said, no, we don't want to have any of this, we're going to pretend it's not happening, we're going to ban your book and lock you up, um, because we don't want to hear about this new science. Almost every word of that could not be further from the truth. Okay, And if, you, if, you're, invest, if you're studying GCSE astronomy, um, it's, I think, important to slightly get your head around the, the true facts, and in some ways, what, what actually went on. Okay, now, it's a complicated area. We could spend many hours on this, but in potted version, here we go. First of all, the idea of Galileo not being a religious person or someone who was out to attack the church is com could not be further from the truth. Uh, Galileo, in my mind, I think, was one of the scientists who quite early on uh, managed to square the idea of religion and science. You often hear people saying the two things don't fit together very well. And uh, some great scientists spend a long time concerned if they have a religious faith that the two things are in conflict. Galileo always, to me, seems to have absolutely squared the two things away perfectly happy. There's a nice quotation from him there, but he's basically saying, God has given me the ability to think and to observe and to reason and to argue. And it seems bonkers that um, you know God would not want me to do these things. It seems ridiculous to him. Secondly, Galileo's oldest daughter, Marie Celeste, who you can see on the painting of on the right there, um, from an early age became a nun and spent most of her life in the convent of San Mateo in the hills there, you can see. Um, and Galileo is very proud of this. And again, if Galileo was anti-church and trying to be, you know, science versus religion kind of person, 
then that would not make a lot of sense. Okay, so you can see there from his own words, from his own actions, etc., with his his um, his children, he was a perfectly religious person at all. He was a regular churchgoer, etc., etc. Uh, he believed in God, and he didn't see any problem between using his God-given abilities to uh, try and understand the universe. Okay. Secondly, the idea of the church would have been anti-astronomy. Um, that doesn't make any sense at all. Top left there is a drawing, a part of the Vatican Observatory. It's one of the oldest observatories in the world, and it's part of the Vatican, which is the centre of the Roman Catholic faith in Rome. Okay, And it is, as I said, one of the oldest observatories in the world. Looking top right, if you have a church near you, go and have a look. It'll probably have a clock on it, and it may well have a sundial. And if you look at very, very old churches, churches made before the invention of the clock, they have a sundial. As we've said before, astronomy is the clock and the calendar. You get time and you get the calendar from the sky, from the study of astronomy. And if you go very, very back in ancient history, um, religion uh, of any kind and astronomy, as you go back into the midst of times, they become almost the same thing. If you go back to the ancient Egyptians, then their observation of the stars moving, uh, the planets moving amongst the stars, etc., etc., uh, all of that was built into their view of the universe, the gods that they had, almost all of them represented particular stars, etc., etc. Um, so religion and astronomy have always been right from the beginning. As soon as humans, human civilization started to get organised, we needed calendars, we needed clocks, and we needed astronomy. And astronomy and the measurement of time and the measurement of the, the calendar through the year is something which is at the, the centre of religion. Okay? Uh, almost any religion, as I said, I've talked here about Christianity, the Roman Catholic uh, Church, because that's what, what Galileo believed in. But if you take any other religion, uh, almost any other religion around the world, they will have festivals at certain days of the year, and those are determined by the motion of the sun and the moon. Almost every religious building will be linked in some way to the measurement of time, and therefore to the study of astronomy. The idea of the church being anti-astronomy makes absolutely no sense at all. A useful way of understanding the conflict which Galileo got into with the Catholic Church is, again, to look at something that comes up a number of times in the GCC astronomy specification. The difference between a theory and an observation. The theory was, uh, at the time, was Copernicus's. You'll recognise that drawing again from Copernicus's book. And Copernicus suggested a theory. He said, I think things would be much easier. The math, the calculations of predicting the position of the planets would be much easier if we put the sun at the centre. Okay, and he put forward his heliocentric theory. He was very careful, Copernicus, if you look into his life you'll see why, but he was very careful to couch it in particular terms and say this is just a way of thinking about the solar system which makes the calculation easier. Okay, Galileo's observations were a bit more difficult uh, to ignore, I don't think the church wanted to ignore them particularly, but um, they're not a theory. Galileo wasn't saying I think there are planets, the little stars going around Jupiter, he was saying, I have some observations, some actual evidence. Okay, um, He said quite forcefully you know, to some people, if you don't believe me and you disagree with me, then by all means go and build your own telescope. Go in your own back garden, look at Jupiter, you will see the same dots. Whether you agree with me or disagree with me, they are there. They are facts rather than just a theory that's been suggested. Okay, And Galileo spent a lot of time discussing this with members of the Roman Catholic Church in Rome and other parts of uh, Italy. And he consulted with them a great deal. Galileo wanted to write a, basically a big book. He was totally convinced now of the heliocentric theory. He thought his observations were strong evidence for it. And he wanted to write that in a big book. And before he did that, as a respectful member of the Roman, of the Roman Catholic faith, he spoke to various people. There were some uh, very talented astronomers within the Catholic Church. So the idea that he was the scientist on one side of the argument and the sort of the church people on the other doesn't make sense. Uh, he spoke to people quite high up in the Catholic Church, many of whom understood his work very carefully, were astronomers themselves, um, so he had a very good debate with them. Uh, some of them were former colleagues of his, some of them were people he knew well, and he spoke to them, and the Church's view was basically this. Uh, if you want to write about the theory of the sun-centred universe, Mr Galileo, then you're very welcome to, but you must always write about it as a theory. This chap from Poland, called Nicholas Copernicus, has suggested the sun-centred theory, and this is what I think about it. They said that would be fine. Galileo wanted to make it a bit, he was a good scientist, he wanted to say, no, I've actually got some evidence from my telescopic observations, as it says in the spec, uh, which really support this theory. And the church said, well, no, that's not quite acceptable. 
Um, not as simple as because it's not what's in the Bible. The Bible has very little astronomy in it. The Bible doesn't really say either way. Uh, but they said it's not the view of the Catholic Church at the moment. And the Catholic Church at the time uh, wasn't just the sort of the centre of Italy. It was the centre of the Holy Roman Empire, which was most of Europe. So arguably the most influential body in the whole of Europe. And they said, well, no, that is not the view. Uh, it is not the view of the Roman Catholic Church at the time that the Earth goes round the sun. Therefore, if you want to write that, you would have to have, and this is the phrase which they provided him with on the right there, incontrovertible proof, proof that cannot be argued with. If you have that level of proof, then you may write your book. But if you don't have that proof, you must always write about the sun-centred view as though it were a theory. Okay. So again, something that gets missed out of almost every documentary and, and textbook is that Gallo spent quite a lot of time talking to people in the, church, in the Catholic Church asking them what it would be acceptable for him as a good Catholic to write. Okay, And let's just take a step backwards. Although as 21st century scientists who know the right answer, we are convinced by Gallo's moon drawings, his moons of Jupiter, his phases of Venus, are they, in a legal sense if you like, uh, incontrovertible proof? Do they prove that the Earth doesn't, sorry, that the Earth goes around the Sun? No, they don't. Um, the moon's going around Jupiter. It suggests the idea of everything going around the Earth is wrong. The phases of Venus, I mean, some people say, why doesn't the Sun, uh, Venus go around the Sun and the Sun still go around the Earth? If you can imagine that, rather a sort of strange view, but it would work. Um, are those observations that he's made with the telescope, are they proving the heliocentric view? Um, and they're not. If, um, if we got some lawyers involved, they would say, well, those observations cast reasonable doubt. In the mind of a scientist, they cast reasonable doubt on the Earth-centred view. Okay? They don't prove the Sun-centred view, but they cast doubt on the Earth-centred view. And remember the phrase top left there from the, from the church, it's not good enough. It's not incontrovertible proof. And pretty much from this time to the end of his life, that's what Galileo was trying to sort out. We'll see later on, he did some experiments on motion and falling bodies and pendulums and tides and stuff. And it's all because he was desperate to find some kind of proof that the sun-centered view was right. And although these observations are really important, and astronomers say, yep, 1609 was crucial because Galileo made these actual factual observations, and that really started to change many scientists' mind. Yes, it did. It did not change the view of the Pope. Uh, because they don't prove the Earth it goes around the Sun, they cast reasonable doubt on the Earth-centred view, but the Church were very clear what standards they wanted from Galileo. Okay. Uh, another thing, perhaps, just to pop into the to the mix, is that uh, Italy at the time was a very different kind of place. For a start, it didn't exist. Italy was uh, unified, so that country like a, a large boot sticking out of the Mediterranean that you may recognise as the lovely country of Italy. That's not how things were in Galileo's time. Each of those little provinces, I mean, they're still there today. You have Tuscany um, and places like that all around. You may recognise some of the names. Um, you have various provinces of, of Italy, a bit like you have counties of the uh, United Kingdom and so forth and states in America. Um, but at Galileo's time, they were nearly 250 years from becoming a whole country. So Galileo, if you said to him, you are an Italian, I was going to put this as misconception three. Many textbooks begin with Galileo was an Italian astronomer. It's nonsense. Italy wasn't going to exist for another 250 years. Galileo would have thought of himself as Tuscan. If you look uh, on the left-hand side of, the, of Italy, about two-thirds of the way up, Toscana, you can see Italy with the beautiful cities of Pisa and Florence. That's where Galileo uh, grew up and was born. And he would have thought of himself as Tuscan. And when he went to Rome, he would have been going to another country, effectively. I mean, some of these provinces were at war with each other on occasions. And that's very much how Europe was. And countries like Italy, countries like Germany, really didn't get formed into a united country until much, much later. So the idea Gallo is an Italian astronomer, part of Italy, not really. He was Tuscan, and when he wanted to talk to people in the, high up in the Catholic Church, he would go to Rome. He'd be going to another country. Uh, he sometimes stayed in the Tuscan embassy in, in Rome. Uh, they were almost effectively, these little provinces of Italy that we think of today, were almost like different countries. Okay, uh, On the right there, a very important character is the Duke Cosimo, the Grand Duke of Tuscany. He was the ruler of Tuscany, he would be like the king to Galileo, because if he lived in Tuscany, it was his word that decided, basically. The Pope, you can see the Pope at the time, Urban VIII there on the left, uh, he lived in Rome. 
Was he in charge of Italy? No, not really. Italy didn't exist as a country. Rome was the centre of the Holy Roman Empire, which covered most of Europe, basically. So Galileo was in an interesting position. He lived in the province of Tuscany. Uh, his ruler was the Grand Duke of Tuscany on the right there. Uh, but in terms of publishing things, as he was a Catholic, he needed approval from uh, the Pope, who lived in Rome and ruled most of Europe, one might argue. Okay. Uh, also, final thing to get your head around why Galileo's discoveries caused such a fuss. Uh, imagine you were Pope, Pope Urban VIII on the left there. What was on your desk at that time? Uh, all sorts of things were going on. Uh, Henry VIII, some time earlier, had found it convenient to uh, take England out of the Catholic Church and become part of the new Protestant Church of England. And England at the time would have been one of the most powerful nations in Europe. Uh, Martin Luther on the right there um, was speaking out very, very loudly against the Catholic Church and claiming it was corrupt and all sorts of things in Germany. There were things like the Thirty Years' War, the huge religious war about uh, which was the right face to have, etc., etc. This was the time when uh, a cheeky chappy from Tuscany popping up and saying, I'd like to have a bit of an argument about whether the earth goes around the sun or not. Not good timing. Galileo really had lousy timing. The church really didn't want to be having this kind of debate about anything because its rule of Europe as the Holy Roman Empire was being questioned on all sides. Anyway, Galileo went ahead and published his book in 1632, which is called The Dialogue. There's a full Italian title at the top there. It's normally shortened to The Dialogue between the two systems of the world, the Earth-centred, the geocentric, and the Sun-centred, the heliocentric. And this is the book which caused tremendous difficulties. Uh, when this was published, Galileo, as uh, we'll find out, got into all kinds of trouble. Um, one of the biggest reasons probably is to do with the way the book's laid out. And you can see on the left-hand side there, the three guys uh, chatting away about stuff. Basically, Galileo set the book out exactly as it says on the tin, as a dialogue between a group of people. Uh, which was kind of the way you wrote textbooks in those days. It's not the style we use so much nowadays. But G Gallo basically set it up a bit like a play in which there were three uh, characters. There was one called Salviati, and he was a proponent of the new Copernican uh, heliocentric sun-centred view. And he would you know, put in for information and stuff about that. There was a character called Simplicio. Think carefully about that name. And he was committed to the geocentric, or the earth-centred view, the traditional view, and he was not changing his mind in a hurry. And there was a third character, you can see on the right there, called Segredo, uh, who basically behaved a bit like the uh, interviewer, or sort of an intelligent layman. And he would occasionally, when things started to flag, he would ask questions like, you know, if that's true, then what about this, or something like that, to keep things going. Okay? But it's basically a dialogue between Salviati, who believes in the new sun-centred view, and Simplicio, who is having none of it and only believes what's in front of him. Okay? And this is the way Galileo laid the book out. Nothing unusual in that. Lots of scientific books were written in that sort of way. But you can kind of see it from the name Simplicio. Um, he puts it on with a trowel a bit too much, and he makes it a bit too obvious that Simplicio is just covering his ears and going la la la, and he's not listening to reason. And by the end of the book, you really start to get the impression Simplicio um, is not the brightest tool in the box, and is not really thinking about things rationally and scientifically. Okay, And one of the problems was uh, many people uh, suggested that Simplicio wasn't meant to represent the church view. Now, who would have suggested this? Certainly not Galileo. That was not his intention. But um, he was quickly called to Rome, as you can see there, and asked to talk about his book. And you can see characters um, from the church there in the background, some, many, close, many of them close to the Pope, for example, uh, who were not fans of Galileo, this, this chap from another country who was suggesting all these things, um, and they didn't like his idea. So many people put the idea into the Pope's ear that in fact Galileo's book was poking fun at the church. Galileo refused, refuted this. He said that was not his intention, etc., etc., etc. But at the time, and what we looked at a bit earlier, this was not a good time for the Catholic Church. And I think what they wanted Galileo to do mostly was to go away and to stop having this, this debate. And that's why his book was forbidden until corrected, or basically banned, uh, which meant all good Catholics were not supposed to be reading it. And he got into, as, he, as we know, a great deal of trouble, um, not really out of the church's objection to anything that he'd written particularly. It was the way in which he'd written it with the Simplicio character, um, helped on by a few people who high up in the Catholic Church who really didn't like him. 
and also the time at which the dialogue was published, which was not a good time to be having this kind of debate with, uh, with the Catholic Church. Okay. Uh, Galileo, looking on the right-hand picture there, was um, put under house arrest in Oshetri in uh, Tuscany, beautiful part of the world. And he was he basically has to st had to stay there, or at least within the village. And he was not allowed to write to any other scientists. He was not allowed to use a telescope. He was not allowed to do any more astronomy. And he basically spent his last years of his life uh, under sort of basic house arrest, only allowed to study certain areas of science and not really to publish very much. OK, um, it's a bit of a mystery. Some people think, oh, gosh, why did Galileo get locked up, etc. In my mind, looking bottom left there, I've got a much bigger question. Why wasn't he executed? Um, people who were deemed to have written stuff which was heretical, which meant against the word of the church, at that time were mostly executed uh, in normally quite horrible public ways. Um, and there's a really big question over Galileo, which is why he wasn't um, executed, as most people, it would be said, most people who were deemed to be in disagreement with the Catholic Church at the time, uh, that was the, the way they ended up. OK, um, I think it's a lot to do with uh, Cosimo, the Grand Duke of Tuscany, who was a member of the Medici family, a very, very uh, long standing, very powerful family in Italy. There's their shield you can see there. Um, if you walk around some of the great cities of Europe, of Italy, you will see that symbol still today. Um, as I say, the Grand Duke of Tuscany was a Medici, which meant he was a powerful, powerful man. Although he was Grand Duke of Tuscany, he had influence in Rome. And for that reason, I think that's the reason Galileo was just asked to, to stay at home and, and to shut up, basically, rather than being executed. He was also very, very famous. It would have been quite a difficult thing for the church to manage. Um, but as we said, it says in the syllabus, the observations started to lay the foundations for the heliocentric view to be taken on. Um, but they really did cause tremendous impact. And it's because they're observations. They're not just a theory like Copernicus had. These are actual observations. Galileo didn't present them well, I don't think. Uh, he could have been a bit more politically minded, a bit more careful in the way he presented things. And at the time, that's probably the main reason. All right? The idea the church wouldn't listen to any science is ridiculous. If you wanted to follow this up, you can read about the discussions Galileo had with senior members of the Catholic Church before he published the dialogue. Uh, it was not Galileo's intention to upset and to cause all this kind of uh, bother. Um, but as I say, he didn't pick a good time and he didn't, didn't pick a good way of presenting his work. Okay. So, uh, hopefully now, we've ticked off the first two. If you've, been, if you've stayed awake through the whole of this video, then you will be aware of Galileo's early telescopic observations, the Moon, the Moons of Jupiter and the phases of Venus, and you'll see why they were a big piece of evidence rather than just another theory for the heliocentric or the sun-centred view. They certainly shook the foundations of the geocentric view, um, and as I say, that caused the way he presented them caused problems with uh, the Catholic Church at the time misconceptions inventing the telescope being italian and also him being a scientist who was at odds with the church because it wasn't what was in the bible again that's the simple view you often hear as you can see there's a bit more to it than that okay finally if you've found this an interesting area of the gcc astronomy specification you'd like to dig a bit deeper then i'm just going to give you a few very quick uh, things not going to go into too much detail but you might want to follow them up they certainly link to other areas of the gcc specification so they'll help to uh, link your understanding and to strengthen it in that way okay uh, first of all, Galileo's other observations. Galileo, one thing Galileo had was plenty of energy. Uh, once he got something in his head, he did it to the max. So he didn't just look at the moons of Jupiter, the Moon and Venus. He looked at all sorts of other things. Okay. Uh, he spent some time in lockdown. As I say, the later years of his life, he was very much cut off from the scientific community, not allowed to do astronomy and had to think of something else to do. Uh, there's a guy called Thomas Harriot we need to have a look at and the mysterious island of Murano. So, as I say, if you want to extend your work on this particular part of the specification, here are some ideas. Uh, first of all, sunspots. Now, obviously pointing a telescope at the sun, even a small one, is incredibly dangerous and is very likely to result in instant blindness. Um, so, as we can see on the right there, uh, a gentleman called Christoph Scheiner is showing us how it should be done. He's pointing his telescope out the window there and he's not looking at the sun through the telescope. He's getting, as you can probably see just off the picture there, the rays from the telescope are being projected onto a piece of paper and then he can look at the piece of paper and do his drawings. Okay. Galileo did the same sort of thing. He projected the image from his telescope onto a piece of paper and he did some drawings of sunspots. 
Uh, he got into a bit of an argument. If you read about Galileo, he was very good at this. He got into a bit of an argument with uh, a Jesuit priest, so very well connected in terms of the Catholic Church, very close to the Pope, uh, called Christoph Scheiner from Germany. Uh, they first of all argued for a bit about who invented, sorry, who first discovered sunspots with the telescope, which was a bit of a waste of time because Chinese astronomers from um, many, many years BCE um, had been doing drawings because you don't need a telescope to spot large sunspot spot groups. Uh, so that was a bit of a waste of time. But they also got into a bit of an argument about what they were. Galileo thought they were spots on the sun. In other words, little dark areas on the surface of this perfect celestial globe which God had placed in the sky. Uh, Christoph Scheiner was having none of that. He said, well, no, that's not true. The sun is a perfect thing. And the sunspots must be like little, perhaps like little moons or little dark things between us and the sun. So a kind of a line of sight effect. They're not actually on the sun. They're just lined up with it. And you can see where they're coming from. Obviously, uh, Christoph Scheiner was trying to preserve this idea that the heavens were perfect and they were never changing and didn't have little black dots on them, basically. And Galileo was saying, look, I'm a scientist. I'm saying what I can see. And that's not what I'm seeing through my telescope. So through this, Galileo managed to pick a fight with a, a fairly high up Jesuit priest in the Catholic Church, which, of course, didn't do him any favours when it came to the discussions about his book, The Dialogues. Uh, Saturn. Galileo also had a look at Saturn, the, um, another one of those little dots of light, those little stars that move around in the night sky. And he, well, that's his drawing on the left there. Galileo never quite worked out what's going on with Saturn. Uh, the be his best guess was there were two moons of equal sizes that went round sort of 180 degrees either side of Saturn. Now, this is easy for us as 21st century people because we know the sun, uh, Saturn has got rings. And what Galileo was seeing through his fairly ropey telescope was a rather fuzzy image of that. Um, and again, this is where Galileo and his discoveries with the telescope are a nice example that you don't often get in school science of, Gal of someone actually on the very edge of science. Galileo had nobody to ask. There was no internet. There were no books on Saturn. Everybody through human history thought Saturn was a dot. He looks through his telescope. He sees the left hand picture. To get an idea of it, you need to put your hand on the screen and cover up the right hand picture. No one's ever seen that. And although Galileo was far from... Uh, far from being dim, obviously he could never quite work it out. You do need a reasonably good telescope to be clear that what you're looking at is rings. Okay, If you already know the answer, it's easy. But remember, no one's ever seen the right-hand picture. The only thing Galileo's got is that left-hand picture. And with the best effort in the world, he couldn't quite get his head around it. It was astronomers a bit later on than him who had slightly larger telescopes, which gave sharper, more detailed pictures. And they worked out that it must be rings. OK, but Galileo certainly looked at Saturn. Again, if you're thinking about the heliocentric thing, whatever those things are on the side of Saturn, whether they're moons or rings, the important thing is they're not going around the Earth. So it's kind of another piece of evidence against the geocentric theory. OK, uh, a bit of fun to finish off with. Galileo apparently discovered Neptune. Now, you might be thinking, hang on a minute. Neptune was discovered by much, much larger telescopes many hundreds of years later. Well, if you look very closely at this little extract from Galileo's notebook, you can see, again, these are the Jupiter drawings. You can see Jupiter in the middle there as it's circled with the moons going round. Galileo's working out where each one's moving night after night. And on the left there, he's got a fixed star, like a reference star, um, which he's drawn in there. And it turns out astronomers have gone back. They've taken the date and the time. They've reconstructed things. And actually, the bright dot on the left there is the planet Neptune. So Galileo actually made a dot in his notebook, to which he thought was a fixed background star that wasn't moving, which actually was the planet Neptune. OK, Neptune doesn't move very much. We said the planets move amongst the stars. Neptune, as you probably know, is a long, long way out and only appears to move amongst the stars very slowly from Earth. And for that reason, Galileo didn't spot it. He marked it down as a fixed star. But technically, uh, I think someone once called it a pre-discovery, uh, he did actually make a dot in his notebook, which was the planet Neptune. OK. Again, another example of it's great in 21st century when you know the answers. Galileo very much doing his science on the edge here. The Milky Way, as the name suggests, people have thought since thousands and thousands of years, like a load of milk spilt across the sky, like a smear of, of white stuff. And Galileo obviously turned his telescope towards the Milky Way and was the first to realise it's just billions upon billions. If you do that, even with binoculars, it's worth a go. If you can get somewhere dark enough these days that you can see the Milky Way, have a look at it through binoculars or a telescope and you will see millions upon millions of stars. Just to link in with the world of physics, because Galileo was not just an astronomer, he's a very talented mathematician and physicist. Uh, while he was in lockdown, effectively, uh, when he wasn't allowed to do any astronomy, 
it kind of made him go back to something which he'd been doing earlier, which was to look at how objects move. And his last book, The Discourse, as that one's called, if you translate its title, um, was to do with how objects move. OK, and why would Galileo be interested in objects moving? Well, it would go back to that incontrovertible proof. Galileo had been challenged by the Catholic Church to find incontrovertible proof that the Earth was going round the sun. Now, Galileo should have waited to the early 20th century when a guy called Albert Einstein with his theory of relativity could have told him that he was largely wasting his time. Uh, if the Earth was at the centre of the solar system and the sun, moon and planets all went round it, then the motion of the dots in the night sky would be largely the same. All right? But Galileo was having none of it, and again, tremendous energy here, just not prepared to give up even when things looked impossible. He spent a long time thinking about the movement of objects. He thought about things on the Earth that might show us that in fact the Earth was not stationary and that it was moving around the Sun. Okay, He spent a long time looking at tides, because if you've ever tried to drink a mug of tea or something when you're in a moving car, what's the, what's the thing that moves all over the place is the liquid. The liquid starts splashing all over the place. And he thought, well, maybe it's like that on the Earth. Imagine the Earth is like a, a car driving around a corner. Surely the water will get sloshed around, even though all the solid stuff seems to be fairly still. And perhaps by studying the tides, you could make a proof for the fact the Earth must be moving. He put a lot of effort into that, and it didn't really come to anything. It's a very complicated um, bit of physics behind how the tides work, particularly in the Mediterranean. And Galileo really got nowhere with that. But when he was uh, in lockdown under house arrest, he went back to this area of physics. And it's worth just mentioning, you often hear about Newton's first and second and third laws of motion. If you read Galileo's discourse, you will find many ideas about gravity, you probably heard the famous story of him dropping things off the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and how objects move, how pendulums swing. Galileo was investigating them because he thought he might find a way of getting his incontrovertible proof of the heliocentric system. But in the end, he wrote up his results in what's called the Discourse, his last book. As I say, you'll find many of what's called Newton's Laws of Motion, basically without the algebra uh, in here. Okay. Um, as always with great discoveries, there's somebody who claims to have got there first. As I said, when the telescope was discovered in Holland in the early 1600s, Galileo wasn't the only one to hear about it. And an Englishman called Thomas Harriot, who has a very interesting life, did all kinds of exciting things. Um, he got the telescope, uh, the idea of a telescope. He made one and he looked at the moon. Uh, I can be a bit cheeky and say he perhaps wasn't quite as good a drawer as Galileo, but he did some drawings. And on the left there you can see one of Thomas Harriot's telescopic drawings of the moon and it dates from before Galileo's one in 1609 not by very much as I say the discovery of the telescope went around Europe like wildfire um, but Thomas Harriot does have drawings in his notebook with dates which are before those of Galileo so technically Thomas Harriot got there first if you go to Sion House uh, in Sion Park in West London on the right there you can see big displays and stuff to do with the work of, of Thomas Harriot okay finally a bit of fun Science about solving problems and uh, investigating things, which are much easier to do now. So you can probably Google for this on your phone. Uh, but Galileo, as we know, when he was developing the telescope, he lived in Venice, a great seafaring port in the Mediterranean. And near there, in the Bay of Venice, there is an island called the Island of Murano. Now, the Island of Murano has been famous many hundreds of years before Galileo, has been famous for making something which is highly relevant to this story. OK? Uh, you might even like to think why it would have been done on an island at the time. But as I say, even today, you can buy this material from Murano, and it's very, very famous all the world, world over for being very, very high quality. So Galileo was lucky to live um, close to the island of Murano, but uh, a bit of fun to finish off. If you want to do some Googling, have a look at the island of Murano. What do they make there that's very, very famous, even to this day, which would have helped Galileo very much in his uh, observations? Okay. Right, thank you for listening. I hope you've uh, enjoyed this video and it's helped you to get your head around section 11.24 of the uh, second half of the GCC astronomy specification. And along the way, I think we bumped into one or two areas uh, from other parts of the specification. Thank you.